All these women here. Yeah. What's that? Said, Look at all these women. I know it's good. good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our seminar on managing capital flows. What is the right policy mix? You know, I think it's uh, virtually every spring meeting and it's, annual meeting we have a discussion about capital flows, yeah. about true. their impact, about oh, uh, how to respond to them. I think we've advanced. I think we have, we've been. We're off to a good start. But I fear to say that uh, the end is not yet in sight. So I'm hoping that uh, today's discussion will move us in the right direction. This is a subject that uh, the fund works on, academics work on, policymakers think about and have to contend with every day, even though answers are not yet clear. Uh, here we are today in uh, the atrium, which is like our center court. And we have some real champions for you today. We have a panel of central bank governors who have thought about this subject and contended with this subject. Um, so let me say a few words to set the stage for the discussion, and then we'll um, uh, move on to some questions. Just before, since I'm sure we will spend most of the time talking about the problems that come from capital flows, let's just remind ourselves that we talk about capital flows because we think that uh, capital flows can be a very good thing, that they're the reason that we allow capital flows in the world is that uh, for uh, developing countries, emerging market countries, attracting capital that uh, contributes to growth can help spur uh, productivity and growth and convergence of living standards. But I think more and more we are seeing that those benefits may come with risks and that some policymakers may conclude that, at least in some settings, the costs uh, may outweigh the risks. I think we've also seen that the global circumstances have uh, changed and evolved in ways that call into question some of the earlier orthodoxy about uh, free capital flows. We are living in a world of uh, greater financial integration, a world where in the major countries, uh, in, the, in the advanced economies and major currency block areas, Rates, interest rates have been very low for a very long time, and where unconventional monetary policy uh, is uh, being practiced, and that's changing market circumstances. This is all, I think, creating new challenges for policymakers to contend with. They're contending with these global factors. They're contending with volatile capital flows. Uh, those are in a, those are the, what uh, Mark Carney likes to call the push factors, what emanates uh, from outside of an emerging market country's uh, perspective. We're, we're also contending with uh, more benchmark indices and changes in the structure of capital markets, what Mark calls the pipes. And this is leaving emerging market and developing economy uh, central bankers uh, thinking about how best to get the, whatever benefits one can, but also how to insulate oneself from uh, shocks. We tend to think also of uh, exchange rates as uh, shock absorbers. That's been our orthodoxy. I think we are seeing in some circumstances that exchange rate uh, can be uh, shock amplifiers or shock transmitters. Uh, I think in this new setting, it's well worth reconsidering uh, all of our views. You know, we've had here for years the institutional views on how to manage uh, capital flows. And we stick with that. But I think along the way, it makes sense to have discussions like this, to be open-minded, to hear what policymakers have uh, uh, experienced, what their objectives are, and how they intend to go forward. We are trying to do that ourselves uh, on fund staff, thinking more broadly even than capital flows. When we say uh, getting the right policy mix, we have to consider other policy areas. How uh, monetary policy, uh, foreign exchange intervention policy, macro prudential policy, and capital flow management policies may all fit together. What are the, what's the right mix? What are the trade-offs? So today, let's uh, uh, turn to our panel. I think we have a great panel to uh, uh, address these issues. Let me uh, introduce, uh, I'm sure most of you know everyone here, but let me introduce uh, our panel. First, we have Stan Fisher to my left who's had a long and distinguished career, not just here at the IMF, but uh, as vice chair of the Federal Reserve from 2014 to 2017, and before that, governor of the Bank of Israel 
from 2005 to 2013. Um, I, I have a, a different order. Mark Carney uh, is governor of the Bank of England since 2013 and is also the first vice chair of the European Systemic Risk Board and was governor of the Bank of Canada between 2008 and 2013. Uh, Elvira Nabulina is governor of the Central Bank of Russia, has been since June 2013. Before that, she was advisor to the president of the Russian Federation uh, for Economic Affairs and held ministerial posts as Minister of Economic Development and uh, Minister for Development and Trade. And si sitting next is Raghu Rajan, the Catherine Dusek Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He was governor of the Reserve Bank of India from 2013 to 2016 and was here, of course, as counselor and director of research uh, at the, here at the IMF. And then we have Governor Noor Shamsia, uh, governor of the Bank Negara, Malaysia, uh, appointed just last year an alumna of the IMF uh, and had uh, a, a career before that uh, at the Bank Negara. I think it is interesting that we have two out of five who have served in two central banks. And we'll see, Mr. Rajan, whether you want to make that three out of five at some point. <laughs> yeah. Let me start with you, Stan, since you've uh, been in two central banks and you've contended with these issues. I think you're in a position to uh, tell us how you're thinking about this subject. I, you know, I know when you were here, you had views about uh, to some extent uh, dubious about uh, the benefits of unrestricted capital flows and of uh, uh, totally free exchange rate movements. How now, as a practitioner, your views have evolved and what uh, experiences you'd like to share? Okay, well, uh, first of all, thanks very much uh, for inviting me to join this distinguished uh, panel. The class of 2013, you could say, since four out of the five, if I listen carefully enough, were, it started their jobs in 2013. And fortunately, we have somebody who's more up to date than we are, uh, Shamsia, the uh, governor of Malaysia. Um, I want to talk mainly about my experience with uh, capital controls. And uh, it'll, so it'll be a historical uh, memory dump. Uh, when I came to the Bank of Israel, they had not intervened in the capital markets for 10 years. And the standard story was, this policy has served the bank well. Well, I knew those lines from the fund because we used to say that uh, about some policy that we weren't absolutely sure was the best policy, but it seemed to be working. And so that was the sort of thing you would see in uh, IMF reports on countries. Uh, from, uh, from time to time. But that was the line, and it seemed to be true. There were no foreign exchange crises during those 10 years, and uh, everything was fine. Uh, the uh, one criticism we got was from the uh, rating agencies who used to come along and tell us all the time, you don't have enough reserves. And then we'd say, well, this policy has served us well. Who knows, etc." cetera. Uh, and that's what we uh, said. And then the crisis came. Well, the, um, at the beginning of the crisis, uh, everybody reduced their interest rates. We had the good luck for technical reasons, which I won't go into, of uh, not, we, the Bank of Israel, of actually reducing our interest rate to 50 basis points the day before the G7 did it. it. Had nothing to do with the G7, but everybody in Israel was persuaded that the G7 had looked at what we did and bang, <laughs> the next morning, there, there it was. It so, certainly helped. Huh? It certainly helped. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so there we were, and uh, the interest rate was uh, going down, and we were still getting a lot of capital coming in. And it went, that went on for several months. <coughs> Why did it go on for so long? Well, I concluded that if that was what we were doing, we'd better have to intervene. And incidentally, we'd in that way be able to raise the reserves and deal with one of, our, one of the critiques of what we were doing. But 
here is a problem. Uh, if you're the legally the sole deci decision maker in a bank, as the governor was in the then Bank of Israel, but the sole decision maker and the only one that anybody agrees with, it's going to be very hard to change policy when everybody who has to, has to carry out the fixed exchange rate policy disagrees. So we worked on it, that is, I worked on it for several months, and I remember being in uh, uh, that place uh, which has a lovely lake with a lovely hotel in it in North India on some uh, official visit and spending all my time inside the room arguing about the exchange rate with my people in Jerusalem. And then as the flows kept coming in, we decided we've got to do something about it. We didn't want to go to negative interest rates. Maybe that was a mistake, but we didn't. And uh, eventually, uh, more and more people thought that made sense, and we decided to uh, go for uh, intervention in the exchange markets uh, because we thought that if we didn't intervene, we'd be forced into negative interest rates. We didn't want that. Um, and I think it, it happened in uh, February or March, whereas we'd reduced the rate in, uh, to, to 50 basis points three or four months before. Once we had it, we had to figure out how to run it. And that is not that simple, especially when there are offshore markets and uh, people can run around you, so to speak, if the foreign, uh, if the foreign capital markets uh, fundamentally disagree with you. So we had to do a lot of little tax-like measures uh, in order to make the thing work, and we managed to figure them out although I'd every, every now and then somebody would come and tell me how you could get around them and then we'd have to find another way of getting them, uh, making it possible. Once we got there, then the next question was, well, when are you going to give this up? And uh, so the statement I, well, I better not tell you what I used to say then. <laughs> um, the, uh, the answer was, we'll, we'll give it up when it's not necessary any longer. And uh, they still haven't given them up. Uh, and the reason they haven't given them up is that Israel's balance of payment situation improved significantly with the discovery of gas, national, natural gas, and uh, with the improvements in the export performance. And we still didn't think that uh, with higher, with a with a, an appreciated exchange rate, we'd be as happy with what was going on in the economy as we were with what we had when we were intervening. So then I asked myself, now why is it that I'm not allowed to intervene? What what uh, what is the theory that says you don't intervene and that that's a good policy? And I concluded that the agreements that were among the large players, and they were essentially that if big country X intervenes, big country Y may be forced to intervene, and then it will really distort the pattern of exchange rates in the world economy. And I concluded that this was not going to have a big effect, our intervening, on the world economy, uh, except as uh, enabling people to say, even, this one is a typical, this is when you know you've gone too far, even Fisher is now intervening. <laughs> uh, that would be sort of my problem. But that's what happened. But anyway, we kept uh, intervening. And I think so far it's done pretty well. Uh, there's a special provision, the way the interventions for dealing with the natural gas receipts are different from the uh, interventions. Uh, the other inter interventions, and uh, they seem to be working uh, okay. So uh, what went wrong? What would have gone wrong? Well, the thing could have broken down. Uh, we could have had this system, and we could have lost control of the exchange rate. We didn't, but we had to <coughs> scramble from time to time. 
and it worked. And then I couldn't quite see why we should give up with it, give, up, give it up at this stage. Um, so that was in 2009 that we introduced them, and uh, it's 10 years since then. And the central bank still is intervening, although less and less, and mainly to deal with the problems of the revenue from, uh, from the gas. So um, we did not intervene in the sense that the market was too, too volatile. It was too volatile at the beginning, and we intervened. But by now, the market is not especially volatile, and the central bank continues to intervene. And it's intervention to affect the rate of, uh, the, to affect the interest rate. So it's almost certainly what the fund doesn't approve of. Uh, and uh, again, then you have to say, well, if you're doing the wrong thing, what's the damage? And I must confess, I can't actually figure out what the big damage is from doing what the rules say don't. So I'll stop at that point. Stan, um, let me follow up on your points and ask, were there episodes where, have there happened to be during this time, episodes where the country needed a change in its real exchange rate and intervention policy had to decide how to allow that to happen, how to, how to accommodate that or, or for a period resist that? If so, how is it handled? If not, how generalizable is your, is your recommendation? We very rarely intervened without the exchange rate moving. Uh, and uh, if everything was fine, that was fine. We didn't intervene. But when, when there were movements of, when there were large movements of money coming in, we would change the amount we intervened. And uh, that, was, uh, that was the answer to that uh, question. So I'm sure if we try to keep the exchange rate fixed, the reserves, which started at $26 billion and are now about 140, uh, would have been much larger if we hadn't let the exchange rate move somewhat. But we didn't let it drive us to wherever it wanted to go. Thank you. Let me turn to uh, Governor Nabiulin. Elvira, as governor of Russia's central bank, you have to contend with uh, from time to time substantial changes in the terms of trade, as well as uh, inflows and outflows of capital that are based on sentiment, as well as sanctions uh, and other issues. Uh, you've maintained an, a fairly straightforward inflation targeting flexible exchange rate approach. Maybe you could say a, a, a few words about how uh, this has worked for you and how you see the role of macro prudential and uh, capital flow measures in that in your setting indeed in the last five years we russia has lived through several waves of uh, capital account shocks sometimes they were aggravated by terms of trade shocks it's quite usual for uh, exporting commodity exporting countries as a result uh, russian economy has delivered it significantly and uh, our external debt uh, has decreased by almost 40%. And what are the main lessons? I think neither free-floating exchange rate regime nor an absence of uh, domestic imbalances <coughs> nor accumulating the buffers cannot fully insulate the economy from shocks. How are these three factors? Uh, can help to um, increase the resilience to shocks. We used almost all of these uh, tools from policy mixed, except uh, capital flow management. I think that capital uh, flow management and capital control is uh, useless and even dangerous um, during the phase of ongoing massive capital outflow. But in general, central banks are more limited in their choice of instruments at the face of uh, capital outflows than at the face of capital inflows. And uh, interventions in currency market 
at this stage of uh, outflow can be interpreted as the attempt of central bank to defend a particular um, exchange rate. And uh, our experience shows that it can even provoke more panic than calm down the uh, market sentiment. Uh, because uh, it provoke more uh, speculative behavior, if you, if you want. And we use monetary policy, and we, we used it uh, in late 2014. And whatever theory says, I think almost everyone uses it not as, uh, only as a tool for policy stability goal, but as a tool for financial stability. And, uh, in practice, increasing interest rate can decrease foreign capital outflow and uh, can prevent further uh, dollarization of uh, savings. It's important for emerging markets. But monetary policy tools, increasing uh, interest rate, uh, can uh, be used and is often used, is often used when uh, capital outflow risks are already unveiled. Uh, in my view, it's more appropriate to take precautionary measures at the um, stage of inflows. I mean macroprudential measures and uh, building buffers. Um, and the most important thing, I think, it's uh, uh, debt sustainability. The leverage should be under control at all levels, government level, household level, corporate level. We use fiscal rule for, to control um, government debt. We use different um, macroprudential measures, including LTV, high risk weights uh, on consumer lendings, uh, DTI. For us, more, um, for us, more tricky how to use, uh, what instruments we can use to control corporate debt. For example, we uh, study now the approach uh, used by Fran France they have these high, inter high uh, risk weights on banking lending to large indebted companies. But even this approach cannot it can, it can only insulate banks, but not the whole economy, because companies can easily borrow from abroad or from uh, financial markets. But I think it's very important on the global level to, to, to think about these instruments, how to control this corporate level corporate debt. Um, and uh, why uh, this leverage is important? I can um, uh, show the example of Russia. For example, uh, we had uh, quite a high share of foreign holdings of our government debt. It's about 34 percent. Last year, it, had, it, it, felt, it fell sharply to 23% because of uh, external factors. And we saw a spike uh, of uh, market volatility. But since the overall government debt is quite low, it's m less than 20%, this uh, effect on market was um, limited and uh, short-lived. That's why I think that sustainability is the, the main um, and the first defense of uh, financial stability. I said that we are very reluctant to use uh, different um, uh, methods of uh, interventions in financial market because we had a long history of these interventions of uh, managed uh, exchange rate. Uh, we think it's better to have these precautionary measures. And for capital control, I've said I think it's useless and it can decrease the openness of the economy and moreover it uh, undermines the investors' confidence. And even if uh, this capital control has a short-term stabilization effect on the markets, long-term lasting effect is, um, I think, I I'm sure it's negative. Because um, investment confidence, I think it's the main assets, uh, is one of the main assets of central banking. It's the basis of its credibility. And uh, that's why we have plenty of instruments, but without this capital control. Thank you. Thank you very much. Governor Shamsia, I've heard you say that you've applied tools very differently in different circumstances. Yes. Uh, maybe you could uh, uh, take us through uh, some of the experiences that you that your countries had. I know this may pre predate this does predate your time at the central bank. 
and explain how you think about the subject. Well, Malaysia is a very open economy. Um, trade accounts for 130% of GDP, and our bond market is deep and at the height of uh, <coughs> non residents can hold as much as over 30% of our Malaysian government bonds, and in our equity market, non residents hold 30% of equities. So, under this context, we have experienced volatile, technical driven, sentiment driven flows. For example, um, after the QE, uh, whatever inflows that we have accumulated over three years, reversed out, 30% of it reversed out within three months. In 2018, uh, whatever inflows that we had accumulated in the first quarter of 2018, all of that flew out within 18 days. So it's extremely volatile. So for us, the policy mix that we uh, employ depends on the risk that is being managed at that point of time. Give me um, an example. In 2015, when oil prices declined by 70%, and Malaysia is seen as a commodity-dependent economy, so we experienced what we call a terms of trade shock. So under that circumstances, the main policy that we used was the exchange rate was the main shock absorber. As a result, our ringgit uh, depreciated by 30%. Fast forward to 2018, uh, and you had all these fears about emerging markets. And on top of that, uh, managing um, the contagion from the emerging market, uh, we also had an unprecedented election results where, for the first time in 60 years, there was a change in government. So investors' confidence at the point of time was very fragile not just investors' uh, confidence, but there was a lot of policy uncertainties because the country has undergone something that had never been experienced before. So under that circumstances, ringgit, allowing the exchange rate to be the sharp absorber can be a shock amplifier. So the main policy response for us at the point of time was to employ more and more effect intervention so that we manage this excessive volatility so that any um, self, uh, sentiments does not become self-fulfilling. So the main policy that we used to manage the capital outflow at the point of time was FX in intervention compared to the uh, episode in 2015 where the magnitude of the outflows were about the same, where the main tool that we used was to allow the exchange rate to be the shock absorber. <coughs> Thank you. So initial conditions matter the risk and the environment matter. But the important thing is for us to be clear what was the source of that risk and what is the most, import what is the most effective tool to manage that risk. And I think the credibility of the central bank can still be retained under that discretionary framework so long as the central bank has a record of being clear of what the risks are what are the policy tools that will be employed? And more importantly, the outcome that the central bank is able to deliver in terms of its mandate. For us, one of the mandates is financial stability. And how we define financial stability is we manage that, uh, the financial stability risk so that the, the money market and the FX market remains orderly to facilitate real economic activities. Right. Thank you very much. So far, Raghu, so far the three have talked about the the reactions that uh, individual countries uh, uh, have and how they might might act. I know as governor in India and, as, uh, and since then, you've been saying that it, it, we shouldn't just think about uh, what the uh, recipient country should do, but we have to take a much broader, more global perspective, taking into account where these spillovers come from in the first place. Maybe you could say a little about how what your thinking is on this now. Sure. Um well, uh, I, I think it's important to reiterate what you started with, that capital flows are generally a good thing, and we want to use them as effectively as, as we can. And um, in that process, we have to consider the volatility of capital flows, the timing of capital flows, and how best they can serve the purpose of uh, financing for investment. Now, uh, just uh, a short recap of where we were and where I think we're going. Uh, we were in a situation where we essentially were of the view uh, uh, that uh, so long as each one kept their own house in order, 
the global financial system worked quite effectively. And, and that meant uh, for individual countries, uh, if in fact you faced a large inflow of capital, you uh, used a combination of monetary policy as well as allowing the exchange rate to, uh, to move in order to absorb those, those flows. Uh, and uh, you know, so long as you did the right thing, uh, it was all balanced, everything was hunky-dory, the system worked. Well, it turns out that it's not as easy as that, that uh, as uh, we've heard uh, the previous panelists uh, say, uh, one of the problems, if you have uh, a sustained period of very accommodative policy, uh, is that you know, capital flows respond, uh, capital flows go searching for yield, and uh, the timing of when those capital flows come in and when they go out are not entirely up to the country receiving. Uh, they often are based on, on, on um, events elsewhere. Um, accompanying this capital flow is a well-documented sequence of rising uh, domestic exchange rates in the receiving country combined with rising leverage levels, uh, simply because the way it often comes in is not as equity but as, as debt. The <coughs> key problem is ultimately with leverage, because once it comes in as debt, it becomes a really hard claim, and when it wants to go out, uh, you either find every which way to accommodate it leaving, or it creates problems domestically. So as a result, um, these kinds of flows, uh, it, it's a great mistake to treat them as permanent and to, to try and do everything you can to absorb them. Um, you've seen that many of the, the, my co-panelists uh, have essentially adopted the policy of trying to build buffers at times these flows come in, uh, but also to uh, try and make sure the exchange rate doesn't move too much uh, with the flows, in part because of what David said uh, earlier, that there seemed to be not the usual sort of uh, uh, traditional view that if you allow the exchange rate to appreciate, it tends to restrain more capital inflow. In fact, it often does the opposite. Allow the exchange rate to appreciate, it draws in more flows, and it becomes a positive feedback loop rather than a negative feedback loop. So it's this combination of rising exchange rates, higher leverage, and greater vulnerability, which I think the emerging markets have been trying to resist. Now, of course, um, when uh, y y you look to where it is coming from, often it is driven by easier monetary policy. Now, obviously, that monetary policy, the aim of that monetary policy is not uh, you know, is not wrong in any, any way. It's about elevating growth rates domestically, but it has spillover effects. And increasingly, I think we're asking the question, are the benefits domestically of higher growth and then the spillovers of that higher growth to the rest of the world, do they outweigh the costs of these spillover effects through capital flows and the rising leverage in other countries which then has to be counteracted and eventually can create problems. So to my mind, uh, this actually is a conundrum for international organizations like the IMF because as far as the rules go and as far as I understand them, what is prohibited is uh, sustained unilateral, unidirectional intervention in the exchange rate to gain a competitive advantage. We have much less clear a, a clear sense of how we deal with situations where there are positive domestic benefits of an action. So the intent is always those positive benefits, mm -hmm. but there are negative external effects. And uh, first, we don't know how to measure the relative weights of those and how, 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 how the costs and benefits trade off. But also, there are no rules in place saying we should behave this way or that way. And, and it, uh, the reality is, perhaps it's time to start asking these questions. How, in fact, should we treat these situations? In general, it's, it's a no-brainer when the positive effects are large and the external effects are small. But what if, uh, if they're more balanced or they go the other way? 
uh, what kinds of international responsibilities do we have? And I have to tell you that, uh, you know, when I started raising the question of international responsibility, uh, I think there's a lot of pushback. Maybe there is no international responsibility. That's a tough world to live in at this point, given the extent of spillovers. Margaret, thank you very much. <clears throat> Mark, you've been in the markets, you've been a governor, and you've been uh, chair of the FSB, so you've seen this subject from a lot of different perspectives. Maybe you could offer some thoughts on how we as an institution ought to be uh, thinking about the subject. Okay. Um, well, first, let me let me welcome this discussion and the work that the fund has been doing on these issues, and uh, uh, very much associate myself with the comments of fellow panelists. Um, and just thinking about um, a bit of a framework uh, that to put it up there and then get discarded. But um, one of the things the fund's been at the cutting edge of is thinking about GDP at risk, capital flows at risk, and to some extent. That's what we're talking about. At a given point in time and through the cycle, how do capital flows and, and principally on the, in good times when capital is, if, if it is good times, it causes bad times is what we're hearing or can do, um, as capital is flowing in, what proportion of those are at risk and what drives that? Um, and as, as you alluded to this in your opening comments, uh, and Raghu's just emphasized, um, there are three, I, I would say there's three buckets of factors that influence it. Um, and one of the start where Raghu left off, which is around um, what, what I would say the push factors, but basically the global financial cycle in, uh, in uh, both up and down. And, and, and to go to Stan's comments, uh, I recall that period, uh, and I recall the actions, both the rate cut and the, and the intervention, and at the time, um, where there were few safe havens, Israel was a pretty attractive uh, safe haven, which caused, uh, caused those problems. So the, the global financial cycle doesn't have to be just on the up. It's when it's on the down, you can have these issues. Switzerland would be another example of somebody who's been affected by that. Um, so the push factors, and this, these, these, this issue has become more poignant um, as the global economy has been reordered. Um, and you know, this room knows it, but... Um, the last time the Fed raised interest rates, um, uh, the emerging developing world was a little more than 40, 45 percent of the global economy. Now it's 60 percent of the global economy. And yet the relative weight of the U.S. dollar and U.S. dollar proxies has remained the same. And again, the fund is out in front in terms of the analysis around this, which has meant that these type of spillover effects, that asymmetry uh, at the heart of the international monetary and financial system has, has become more marked. So, there is this question of spillovers, spillback, and incorporating, and, it, and arguably it will become uh, more pronounced uh, with time, first point. Secondly, we need to think about the, the system as a whole. Where does that capital flow through? Um, and if think about the system in terms of pipes, if I can put it that way. Um, so what influences the, the resilience of that system? The IMF's at the center, global uh, financial safety net at the center, but also a big development in terms of the nature of the flows. Of course, you know, the experience has been that uh, F FDI is, uh, is a more stable, historically been a more stable form of inflow. Short-term bank debt has been a very unstable form of inflow. And the question is, where, where is asset management, uh, market, so-called market-based finance, which has accounted for virtually all of the flows over the course of the last decade to the emerging world? Where does that fit on that continuum? I think that's an open question. That becomes a question uh, not just for the jurisdictions from which this capital is coming, and two-thirds of that comes from uh, the U.S., the U.K., and Europe, um, but uh, for the whole system. And uh, so the FSB and the IMF need to, and are, think through, are, these, are there structural... Um, liquidity issues in these vehicles? Are they buying uh, debt that ultimately very quickly does become illiquid and they have daily liquidity and does that mismatch matter and does it matter for the volatility of capital flows? I think that's an open question that needs to be addressed. So the, that's the pipe spit. And then what we've been spending a lot of time on and it gets a lot of focus is the, um, is the pull factors, the domestic factors, everything from microstructure and depth of markets, institutional credibility of the central banks, um, fiscal policy, macro prudential uh, policy. And I think what the fund can do is to uh, 
try to pull all this together and dimension, I mean, it's an ambitious task, so it's over to you, uh, but We'd like to have and on the brain trust here, you like ambitious tasks, mm -hmm. which is right, and it's, it's core to your mandate, I think, is to dimension these various factors. And, and to put a, I'll just give one or two examples and Please. then shut up. Um, so there are times when the global financial cycle, the push factors are very strong or very weak. Um, and having a view on where we are in that, which is something again here, um, a view can, a coherent and consistent view can be developed, informs policymakers domestically uh, about the kind of risk that they, they could be facing, first yeah. point. Another example though, is that um, one of the big links that's been mentioned by uh, my colleagues on this panel has been what happens to domestic debt. Sometimes that can be fed from easy conditions of inflows, but it's also a domestic prudential and macro prudential responsibility. And I think you'll find in all these cases, I know is the case back to Stan's example in Israel, that the um, capital flow management or the intervention policy was matched by a series of tightenings in the domestic housing market. I, there were examples actually both Russia and Malaysia as well. So that you start to move to an integrated framework and you're thinking about on the margin what's going to make the biggest, uh, the biggest impact. Last point just to reemphasize, I do think as the, the, the financial policy makers, if I can put it that way, those around the table at the FSB and the IMF is there, need to think about the structure not just of the banks and cross-border flows, but also of market-based finance and how it plays into these, these sets of issues. Mm -hmm. Great, I think these have been, we've taken a good amount of time, but I think it's well worthwhile because we've, you've all laid out an awful lot of, uh, I think, sensible frames that have implications for what we ought to be thinking about. I think at the most ambitious level, what, what Raghu's suggesting, the question of the responsibility of the push factors, that's, that's a difficult one. Uh, you know, we've been thinking about it. But I do wonder, in light of what I've heard, whether we should be thinking about different policy ideas and approaches for recipient countries depending on what's the push factor of the moment. I, you know, and, and it sounds as though, for example, uh, you know, when, when it, if, it's, if there's a commodity price boom and some real change that has to happen in Malaysia, in a sense, you let that have its ramifications, but when the push factor is, is, uh, has to do with risk sentiment, which may be being affected mm. by uh, advanced country monetary policy stance or, or something, you might have a very different uh, reaction. Um, I guess my question, it comes back to something that Governor Shamsi has said, which is whether central banks can have the credibility to not have a simple scheme, to shift gears and to say we're going to do it this way in this state of the world with this push factors and this way in the other. I think, you know, Governor Shamsi said you, you, you were able to square that, you were able to, to do that. I think, Stan, you were saying, you, if I understood you correctly, you mostly had events in one category and so the, the issue didn't quite come up so much. The question, is, and, and I think uh, Governor Nabiulani, you said that that especially when the credibility of a central bank is still being established, it's very hard to have uh, a, that kind of differentiation. I wonder if people have reactions to whether this, this, uh, the approach really can be, uh, let's call it, situational. Uh, can I also mention the macroprudential issue? Please. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of what the framework is. It's sort of funny. We're talking about under what conditions is is it permissible to intervene by acquiring uh, foreign assets? And we haven't talked about the exchange rate very much. And the question is, when do you, well, what is the combination of exchange rate behavior and, uh, uh, and, uh, inter and purchases or permission for foreign, uh, foreign capital to come in that we like, and are there in fact three types, or is there just one type, uh, which is more foreign, more foreign capital may be uh, problematic at many times. And I don't quite know uh, how to answer that. But what uh, does strike me is the, how do you stop? And that's part of the, uh, 
technology. That's part of the what are we managing and what are we managing it uh, for. And uh, I'm finding it very difficult to find the principle that we should be using, or the principles we should be using to decide when to, uh, when to uh, deal with these capital flows. And is there any difference between that and deciding when to intervene in the foreign exchange markets, which this fund has discovered, discussed for decades? Uh, I have thoughts on that, but you go ahead, okay. Uh, Mark. Okay. Um, well, I think earlier on you said um, you made the, you raised David the uh, real exchange rate, um, and I think this is a big component of this. And the question is, is there is it is there a persistent or a sustained uh, change? Uh, factors have changed that are driving the real exchange rate, and then there's a decision that has to be made of how that adjustment is taken over what time horizon and can you credibly influence uh, the balance between on the spot exchange rate versus um, domestic prices? What could the policy um, uh, choice, how could that affect uh, you know, uh, domestic conditions? So you have pressure, I'll put it, be more precise, you have pressure for a real appreciation either because something wonderful is happening in your country or something terrible is happening somewhere else. Uh, or some combination of the two. You have pressure and it's, and it's sustained. Um, do you take all of that on the spot exchange rate or to what extent do you take some of it through domestic inflation? You know that, but the extent to which you're doing the latter, you're running looser monetary policy, what implications does that have for tighter prudential and macro prudential policy? Does that set of policies, is that coherent? Is it sustainable? Um, are you, and can you explain it which actually, we were talking earlier, if I may, I mean, this is part of the challenge because if you can't explain it, then you, it's very tough to get out of it mm -hmm. and it's tough to retain credibility because in the end, what you're trying to do, if, and I'll finish here, okay. is you're trying to smooth a, an adjustment, not target a point exchange rate. Um, and I'll give you a final imperfect example of this because it didn't involve capital flow management but post-referendum, um, there was a view that uh, in the market, and it's understandable that for a period of time, there would be a real income adjustment for the UK, a lower real exchange rate as a consequence of changing terms of trade <laughs> for some period. Um, uh, that meant um, that had consequences. There's two ways to take that. Um, one is through uh, the lower real incomes could have been taken through higher unemployment, or temporarily higher inflation. We tried to be very clear that we were going to choose the latter, stretch out the horizon over which we brought inflation back to target. Um, but that was only operating in a couple of variables, and what we're talking about here is operating in a few other dimensions. Right? Yeah. Others? Thoughts? I think what you said, it boils down to you know, uh, what Mark has said, the source of risk, and what is it that you're trying to manage. Um, an example was in 2016 of the U.S. presidential elections. We saw that there's greater spillover uh, from the OPEC uh, and the F offshore markets into the onshore. Uh, and the offshore market had implied that the onshore rate should be, less, uh, should be 6% uh, weaker than what the onshore rate was. And in that, in that instance, you know, employing uh, FX intervention will not work or, or and, uh, and allowing the exchange rate to move to that extent will be destabilizing um, to uh, financial stability. So the only option that we could take at a point of time, especially when you have such high non-resident holdings of your bond market, was to employ capital flow management measure. Mm -hmm. And looking back, what we put in in 2016 um, to reinforce the non-facilitation of NDF uh, transaction was fast forward to 2018 when we had that kind of pressures um, on our ringgit and outflows. The 2016 measure had what we call all those capital uh, flows at risk had flew out. So what remained in our domestic market were the more stable uh, holders of our bond market. And in a way, that saved us in 2018 also because then the depreciation pressures and the outflows pressures that we had 
uh, experience in 2018 will be much more had we not taken the 2016 measure. So it goes back to you know, um, really looking at what is the, the risk that you're trying to manage and what would be the best tool to manage that risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stan, I think let me respond to your question with a question. I think what's just been said in a way is that some capital flows are desirable and some capital flows, especially in certain circumstances, are undesirable. And you know, we can perhaps measure them but with metrics of capital at risk. I, guess, I think the question of instrument that you raise is, are there instances where macroprudential policies can help you differentiate the more valuable capital flows, the more valuable capital flow moments, let's call it, so that the, so your policy doesn't dissuade in some sense uh, or disincentivize the useful capital yeah. flows? Well, I mean, that, that's uh, reasonable enough. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of something that's really gross, but, and you're all permitted to say, don't, don't speak about this ever again. Um, the, uh, it seems to me that if you're the United States or the European Union or something big, you'd better have capital markets that can handle the flows of capital that you have to deal with. And if you're a small country and they pick on you every X years or every uh, now and then, you're entitled to intervene in the new set of rules uh, of, the, uh, of the fund. Because I think if uh, everybody was permitted to intervene in that way, we'd have a really difficult, a much more difficult system to manage than we currently uh, have. But wearing my Israeli hat, which uh, not for religious <laughs> reasons, I should say. Um, I, I couldn't imagine that uh, the interventions that would come in, would have come in in 2000 and, uh, and, uh, fi uh, sorry, 2009, uh, would have been handleable. Whereas big countries, it was kind of like nothing much. Yeah. I'm not sure your hub and spokes uh, approach would uh, pass muster with Ra with Raghu. Maybe you could say no. a few words about no, that. It's, it's all right. Raghu and I have an agreement. He tells me when I'm allowed to do things. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, look, uh, I, I think the reality is that uh, we're away from the pristine world we had or we thought we had. It's a far uglier world. And we have ugly policies. Uh, certainly at the emerging market end, we meddle in various things because there's no clean way of, of trying to deal with these inflows. So we intervene in the exchange rate uh, so as to build buffers when it's coming in. Uh, we try and put limits on leverage. Uh, you can't lever more than a certain amount. We try and limit certain <laughs> kinds of foreign inflows. I think even in the midst of this ugliness, it's important to remember you don't want to scare off foreign investors. And so the idea that whatever you do has to be defensible and ha shouldn't be changing the terms of the contract vis-a-vis -vis existing in investors. They have to know that you're adhering to whatever contract you had with them up front. Yeah. And so I think it, it's really a mistake to put in place constraints, for example, on outflows because uh, you are changing the terms of the contract and, and they remember uh, down the line. Uh, at the same time, uh, I do think this, uh, the sense of asymmetric responsibility that uh, I think Stan was going towards uh, uh, sort of makes sense that when you have deeper financial markets, when you have more liquid financial markets, uh, and you can allow the exchange rate to take some of the impact of capital flows without a huge, huge movement, whether at that point uh, you perhaps have somewhat greater uh, responsibilities to avoid abrupt actions of the kind that some of the smaller uh, emerging markets do. I think that's, that's certainly worth thinking about. Uh, the, the other aspect is, I mean, we still haven't uh, come to the issue of, uh, of how do we deal with the sending country problem. And, and I think that, uh, I mean, again, it would be 
uh, we need far more research on this to understand what can be done and what, what kinds of circumstances. And of course, the association with the domestic uh, uh, sort of business cycle and the financial cycle. But is there a possible aim at some point to come up with a menu under these circumstances, don't even worry about, about what's going on outside. Under these circumstances, perhaps you have to pay more attention. And under these circumstances, it's probably fragile enough that perhaps there has to be some uh, discussion of what you want to do given, given the... Ex I mean, I wonder if we can go towards that and that will allow for more stable uh, capital flows over time. That's certainly worth thinking about. Thank you. It's a tall order, but I think we should think about it. Um, Mark, I'll come to you in one minute. But uh, Elvira, on the question of the use of macro prudential measures, are there ways in which you in, in Russia have been able to try to attract certain capital flows or, or, or amounts and, and, and avoid others? Do you view that as an objective of policy? I think in general capital inflows is good for the economy if it boosts uh, economic growth and productivity. But uh, when we see this capital inflow at the late stage of uh, cycle, uh, it can only accelerate the overheating and that's why we uh, need uh, to use macroprudential uh, measures, uh, first of all, uh, to uh, to keep the leverage under control. I, I repeat that it's the most important thing. Um, and um, Extend to it. Extend to if I may, one remark Please. about these um, yeah. uh, uh, interventions, uh, uh, interventions in uh, currency rate to smooth uh, the currency um, uh, volatility through cycle, not in the case of sharp uh, um, or severe risks for financial stability, but uh, we are discussing how to move this long-term volatility of exchange rate. I'm uh, quite doubtful about this because we don't know what is the equilibrium exchange rate. And if we start intervening in this case, we can see a significant deviation from fundamentals. Yeah. And the mistake of central bank can be huge. Uh, the second thing is the communication challenge. When we intervene in the financial market, uh, when there is no obvious risk to financial stability, everyone starts thinking that we, we are managing the currency rate. And I think it undermines the credibility of central bank, of its, uh, uh, the first um, goal of uh, every central bank monetary policy price stability. And I think that it's the main goal, and we should think how in this not simple framework, but integrated in inflation targeting, not to uh, forget about our first goal. Yeah. Uh, that's why I think it's very important, and the communication is very important. But macro pro measures, they are tricky as well. I remember that recently we discussed how we can explain these monetary policy tools combined with macroprudential tools. And uh, the markets and um, general public doesn't, don't understand clearly how we use these tools or those tools. But I think uh, maybe my main message not to forgo for forget about this transparency of the policy of central banks mm -hmm. when we yeah. try to, uh, to accomplish so many goals. Yeah, I'm glad you remind us. I think the issue of, uh, the, the question that's often on my mind is how, if, if you really need different policies for si different situations, how you maintain credibility and clarity of the policy regime uh, when you need to switch it up uh, the way we've been talking about. We have only, uh, we have no time left. Let me give you, Mark, a couple of minutes. Uh, you can have the last word. Okay, um, just a, a couple final quick observations. One is, um, uh, you know, the asymmetry point very clearly comes through on the way in as opposed to the way out. Um, but that's also true of prudential and macro prudential. It is, I mean, in an absolute reversal of the lean versus clean uh, doctrine or clean versus lean doctrine on monetary policy, it is much easier to lean on the macro prudential side 
when times are good, when things are moving. And, and that is also, as, as you know, Vera, that's easier to explain uh, to the general public because there's not that restriction. And of course, and the biggest challenge is, is, um, is, is not doing enough because you're leaning against the counterfactual. So that's one point. Second is, um, you know, I guess, the, I guess the question, is it an ugly world or is it a world in metamorphosis or transition, right? Um, and it really, you know, emerging economies are called emerging economies for a reason. Um, and there is this huge transition, which is why this issue is coming to the fore. And I guess we're best placed to remind ourselves that. I would, I would in general agree with, you know, directionally that if you have these deep capital markets, um, and, and you don't need to be one of the SDR, um, uh, you know, there are other uh, advanced economies um, that um, have the ability to be part of the, that grouping. But also the responsibility grows with each day, week, month as uh, the major emerging economies emerge, and that is a responsibility also to deepen all aspects, including domestic financial uh, markets and, and macro prudential other tools. But the last point I wanted to make, is just to, if, if a bit unfair, but well, it's fair enough, um, uh, <laughs> pose a question to Stan, because it, it goes to Raghu's point, um, and ultimately, and I'll tee it up like this, I mean, the way I think about these issues is that there is a, the Fed, which in many respects is who we're talking about, um, or principally talking about, has its political mandate, its mandate given by Congress. Um, its responsibilities are for, um, you know, uh, full employment and price stability in the US, the dual mandate. Um, it has to then take into account the world. The question is, to what extent is the world spill backs in its reaction functions and how quickly is that changing? And so my I'm simplifying, but that's my take on it. So if I may turn to Stan and ask him, who also sat um, and made these decisions, to what extent in the Fed's reaction function did you weigh the spillover, spillback consequences? That's fair, and, and since Stan has seniority in this building, he gets the last word. So let me just <laughs> say ahead of it. I suspect that Raghu's still thinks the Fed... I should have responsibility, even if the spillbacks are modest to the United States, they should have a responsibility to... Well, spillovers versus spillbacks, that's the question Mark yeah. is asking. Should you be concerned about spillovers at all, or only about spillbacks? The domestic mandate says spillbacks. Right. Yeah. And whether in some future world we should be moving towards spillovers. Right. And, I, real that, and my point is, my point, if I may, is in a political economy, I mean, I, I read a very good book called The Third Pillar the other day, um, and in the political economy and in subsidiarity, it's very difficult to have that world of course. that you just described. Of um, course. So. Hoist with my own yeah. pillar. <laughs> Sorry, your own pillar, yes. <laughs> Professor I will put you Fi back on a, flat, on a pillar, yes. Professor Fisher, you get the last, last word. Okay, I could think of only one example. Um, that I think did influence our thinking. It was the fact that the Mexicans were using the capital markets to intervene in a very predictable way. They sold, they sold, uh, um, uh, what were they? They were derivatives of some sort. Tesso bonos. Is that not Tesso bonos. Mm -hmm. The uh, ones that they sold when, when they were trying to affect the exchange rate. Oh, the, the, the you mean this was NDFs? Yeah. yeah. Right. I think we took, I took that more seriously because mm. they thought about the market, they thought about how this thing was going to work and so forth. Right. Uh, I can't think of others that met that requirement while I was here, but my guess is if you say, yes, they're going to intervene, but it's in a form that is A, logical, and B, uh, sensible, and uh, C, people understand it, then I think you'd start saying, well, that one is okay. We can, we can live with that one. But uh, I'm not sure when it comes, push comes to shove, whether they'll agree with what they've said they will agree with. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your um, experiences, your ideas, your wisdom, and giving us all a lot of homework. Thanks to everyone.